morning, people of God. Everybody take a deep breath. Relax. I know the world's crazy out there, but this is the house of God. So we're just going to relax a little bit and see what he has to say to us today. Uh, the Emotionally Healthy Christian. We've been working on this series for a few weeks. Pastor Rick was given an amazing opportunity to travel to Israel. Uh, I had a report that he is studying very hard. Apparently it's a pretty rigorous study, 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 and then go out and visit the places we've studied about. So I imagine he's going to be a little worn out when he gets back. But I'm really excited to, to hear what he has to bring to us. Also... Those of you who have not been to Refresh 2.0, I'm going to put another plug in for that. Uh, I went to the last one. If you're even considering it, don't. Just be here. It was great. It was a very casual setting. We were able to share with one another and worship the Lord at the same time. We played games. We interacted as families. It wasn't just one age group. It was the whole spectrum. It was great. I think that's the way... A church body and a family of God is supposed to interact. So come Wednesday and have fun. Eat dinner with us. It'll be great. All right. So let's see if I can. Oh, today's lesson is growing into an emotionally mature adult. I Okay, so I had the same reaction. When <laughs> See, those of you who aren't laughing, it's because you don't know me very well. When Pastor Rick said, would you, would you be willing to do this? And I said, no. <laughs> and then I finally agreed, but I didn't know what the topic was. And so when I found out it was about maturity, I thought, this is a joke, right? You want me to talk on... What do you... <sighs> For those of you who don't know, my day job is I'm an elementary school counselor. So I work with elementary kids all day long. And that a lot of that kind of rubs off on me, and it's been great because I haven't actually had to grow up. So I'm not really, anyway, emotionally mature. But the subtitle is what we're really focusing on, uh, learning new skills to love well. Because I want you to keep in mind as we talk about all the things we're going to talk about this morning, that the goal is to love others well. And that is a hallmark of emotional maturity. So I wanted to start with this. A week ago, this, and so Rick's been gone for what almost two weeks now, and, and so I've known I'm going to do this for a few weeks. And, and when you start to prepare for something like this a few weeks out, it, it's kind of in the back of your mind all the time. In everything you see and hear and do, you're relating it to what you're, what you're really digesting as far as what you're going to talk about. So a week ago, and we have this new puppy, and a week ago, my wife gives this puppy a bath, and, and his name's Mo. And he's really, we got him after the girls went to college to kind of be a companion for Ronald. And as Mo is bathed and he smells nice, and we're like, you know what? I love this dog. He's got a great personality. He's still a puppy, still pees on the floor and jumps around. But we love this dog. And my wife lets him outside to do his business, and then she leaves, and I go out to get the dog. And just had this bath, and this is, <laughs> normally he's all one color. So I look at Mo, and at first, my first reaction is, I'm going to kick this dog. And then my second reaction is, my wife's gone, that means I have to give him another, I'm going to cry. And then my third reaction is, you know what, he's a puppy. I'm going to look past his behavior and realize that there's a need in his life that he just needed to do this, and, and I, still, I still love you. And then God, like, whispers in my ear, <laughs> that's you. I just get you cleaned up, and then you go out and get all dirty again. Seriously? I'm like, sorry, God. So, I don't know. I just wanted to share that. I don't know if it has anything to do with what we're talking about, but. Let's pray. Father God, I just ask that you would settle our hearts, our spirits. Lord, that you would speak into our lives. Lord, that you would help us to have an assurance of the amazing love that you have for us. And because of that love that you have for us, we would be able to love others well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right. One of the things I wanted to start with is this idea, since we're talking about maturity, there's a difference between emotional maturity and spiritual maturity. But you cannot be spiritually mature unless you are emotionally mature. Just think about that for a second. So here's what happens often. There are people who are emotionally immature that think they're spiritually mature, but the reason they do that is because they're religious. You can be religious. You can be all wrapped up in the discipline of being a Christian. You can be all wrapped up in the legalism of it, the whole idea of it, but not really embrace the meaning of it without being spiritually mature and because a lot of times we're not emotionally mature. And unfortunately, in the public eye right now, I think we're seeing a lot of that. People say, well, they say they're a Christian, but are they really being a Christian or are they just being religious? You guys see the difference? You can be religious without being emotionally or spiritually mature. Because we know about spiritual maturity. Um, it says, Paul says this, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Spiritual maturity means to be more Christ-like. Paul very clearly says, this is not a destination. It's not like all of a sudden I'm like, whoo, I'm here. We're on a road trip. GPS says I'm here. You have arrived. It's on the right. We're not there. It is always a direction. Paul says, I am straining forward. I'm reaching for the goal. I'm not going to quit. I'm not there yet. That's Paul saying this. Wait a minute. Me too. I'm not there yet. But we're going to strain forward. It is a process, not a destination. We know the signs of spiritual maturity. In Galatians 5, it says this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. You guys know the song? Yeah. So we were talking about this in Sunday school the other day, and they all start singing this fruit of the Spirit song. It's kind of Camille's fault. But we know that the fruit of the Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And that shows maturity. And if you look some more in this passage, I didn't have it up here, but it also shows the signs of immaturity. Strife, bitterness, envy. You can read the whole list. So we need to weigh these things. And if you have time, write this scripture down. Look it up later. Meditate on it. Am I showing the signs of maturity? Or am I showing the signs of immaturity? We need to think about that. And we look here in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, what is the very first fruit? What is it? Love. This is the primary fruit of the Spirit. This is the cardinal trait of Christians. It is other places in Scripture. It says, this is my command. Love. Love, love, love. It's all over the place. And he says this. They're going to know that you're a Christian by your love. This is it. If you miss everything else, get this idea that love is important. So to be spiritually and emotionally mature, you need to learn to love. So let's learn how to love well. So growing up, and especially in high school... I would have people tell me all the time that you need to grow up. You need to be more mature. You're acting immature. You're doing and then so this little saying I had all the time, I would just kind of respond right away is maturity isn't how you act, it's how you react. And you gotta think about that for a minute. What does that even mean? Well, you can act any way you want, but out of your heart comes the way you're gonna react. And literally the way we act is driven by what's inside of us. And so until you have a maturity inside, your reactions are going to be immature. So I don't know if that meant I was mature or not, but that's what I used to say. And what I meant by that is we need to react out of what is in our hearts, and we want to make sure that that is mature. 
And when we realize that, it's going to help us to look past behavior to need. All the time, people are doing things that bug me. I watched a movie and then I also heard somebody speak the other day and in both of those they used the word irksome. I haven't had that word for a long time. Sometimes what people do, it's irksome. It bugs me, it bothers me, I don't like it. And I want to react to it. I want to just shut them down. But then I have to realize, you know what? There's a reason they're doing that. There's a need inside of them that's causing them to act, right? Right? They're reacting out of what's in their heart. So if I can look past that irksome behavior to what's going on inside, then maybe I can still show them love because I realize it's about a need, not about this behavior that bugs me. Because if I'm doing that, then it's all about me. But if I look at their need, now it's about them. And that is part of loving well. I need to be able to look past people's actions to their needs. And if I don't, Shame on me, because that irksome behavior, if that need isn't met, guess what? It's going to continue to manifest itself over and over again. So the one thing I don't want to have happen is going to continue to happen, because that need hasn't been met. And we need to understand what the need is in our own life. And being part of mature is, we also need to be mature enough to be responsible for ourselves. Because the issues in your life, the ones you don't deal with, those are the ones you are going to deal with. Last week, uh, Mike did a great job about talking about grief. Maybe the issue in your life is grief. And until you deal with that, you're going to be reacting out of that grief. And it's going to affect you. But maybe the issue isn't grief. Maybe it's something else. But I'm here to tell you the issue that you don't deal with is the issue you're going to deal with. It's going to control you. It's going to own you. It's going to cause your behaviors to be what they are. You're going to be a slave to it. It's going to rule you. The issue you don't deal with is the issue. And I have a video that I'm going to show you. And I really debated whether or not to show you this video. But in counseling, there's this kind of famous video. Um, and hold it, just say, yeah, there's this kind of famous video. And it really, I'm, I'm misusing it a little. It's really about how men and women communicate differently. But I'm going to show it to you because it really drives home it really nails the point that the issue is the issue. And the thing that really put me over the edge on showing it to you is I was watching it at school, after school, because the Internet there is much better than at home. So it's after school. Everybody's gone except some teachers. And one of the teacher's children are still there. And then they get bored. Sometimes they come down to my office because I'm so mature. And they come down and they want to play or whatever. And I'm watching this video, and he's a second grader. And he comes behind me because I'm watching this video, and he's like, is that what I think it is? I'm like, "Mm -hmm." And then, wait, let's watch the video, and then I'll finish this conversation. Okay. The issue is the issue. There's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me, and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless, and... I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Come on. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have? Okay. So obviously, this is really about how men and women communicate. But 
the second grade boy says, is that a nail on her head? I'm like, it is. Why is there a nail on her head? I'm like, I don't know. And then he says this, and this is what made me decide I'm going to show this to you. Why doesn't she just take it out? Thank you. That would make sense. All right, so I'm going to get off subject for just a second. Men, when your wife comes to you with a problem, lead with this. Do you want me to help you fix it or do you just want me to listen? And then go with whatever she says. I know it's frustrating to us because we're like, yeah, but if we just took the nail out, it would be, don't do it. (laughs) The issue is the issue. And sometimes it's obvious to everybody else but you. Sometimes you might need help getting that nail out. But the point is, as long as you don't take care of that issue, it is going to control you. It's going to own you. And it's important to realize that the issue is the issue. Today, the issue is love. So we need to deal with that. So I'm going to go with this. 1 John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. And verse 19 is key. We love because he first loved us. We cannot love others well until we realize that we are loved. We are. But sometimes we forget that. It's the assurance of that love that we need in our life. Because we already have the love. And if we don't have that, we have fear. It's insecurity. We feel rejected. We feel like we can't do what we need to do. And all of us have been there. When a loved one in our life, we feel like they've rejected us. Or they're not behind us. Or we don't have that assurance that the love is still there. There's an old saying that says, behind every good man is a good woman. Because we knew. If I have the love of my wife at home and I'm secure in that love, I feel brave enough to take on anything. But if I'm insecure at home, how is that going to manifest itself other places? The problem is, is that sometimes we look for those things to come along and complete us. Because that's a myth in our culture, right? You complete me. I need the other half of me to be complete. No, that is wrong. If you're waiting for somebody else to complete you, you are going to be sorely disappointed. It is not going to happen. As a matter of fact, if you enter a relationship because of that need in your life, that's not fair to that person because you're only bringing half a person to that relationship. You're not complete. Who is the only person that complete can complete you? The person of Jesus Christ. If you don't have God's love in your life, if you haven't found your completeness in Christ, you're not going to find it anywhere else. Don't enter a relationship to meet that need because you're not going to find it there. In a year or two down the road, you're going to be disillusioned. And then you're going to be like, I guess I'm not in love anymore. And I guess this relationship isn't what I thought it was going to be. No, you're looking for something unreasonable in that relationship. They can't complete you. You need to be a complete person before you enter. And I know people have entered the ministry because of a need in their life. They're not going to be satisfied. I'm not saying God can't use them in that ministry, but if they're looking for the ministry to complete them, they're looking in the wrong place. They need to look to Jesus to complete them first. And then, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Once I know that I'm loved, now I have the ability to go out and love others, but not until. Jesus told a parable that helps illustrate this. This is in Luke 15, and it's nestled among some other parables that talk about losing one thing in the midst of others and then spending all of your time and effort to get that one thing back, a coin, a sheep. Jesus told this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the son got together all he had set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Here's a son who said, you know what? I'm going to walk away from the father's love. But when he did, he realized there was a hole in his life, and he tried to fill that hole. And he tried to fill it with wild living. 
Here's the thing about that. There are many great things that God created to bring us pleasure in our lives. But if we use it outside the right context, instead of making us stronger and more complete, it destroys us. So he's got this hole in his life, and he tries to build these bridges across. The problem is, it works for a while, but when the bridge collapses, it takes parts of you with it, and the hole just gets bigger and bigger. And there's only one thing that can fill that hole. And we're going to skip a little bit. It says, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You know, he wanted life. He wanted liberty. He wanted the pursuit of happiness. He ran away. He ends up near dead. He is not free. He's in bondage. And he is definitely not happy. He's in misery. So now he has this hope. He remembers this glimmer of, I was loved. That hole was filled when I was home. And he turns that hope back towards the father. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. And he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Look at the order of how this happens. The father is not at home saying, that boy ever comes back. He's actively looking. He has actually put parts of his life on hold because he is seeking his son. He has looked past the behavior and he sees the need. He needs my love. And he doesn't wait for the son to come and repent. He runs out and loves him. And then the son repents. He is loving him the whole time. He's looking past that behavior, that wild living, and he says, this son needs my love. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf, kill it. Let's have a feast, celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. We are going to have a party because this boy gets it. The love of the father. But this isn't even the son I really want to talk about. Because there's another son, the older son. He was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? The younger son, he we know what he represents. It's the way of the world. It's the people that turn away from God and they go. Here's the older son. He's still with the father. He's doing everything right. He's religious. And really, who's he talking to here? The Pharisees. So it's really, he's talking to the people of the church. Could be us. You guys are in church. You're doing your discipline. You're reading your Bible. You're praying. You're singing your worship song. But look at him. When he came near, he heard the meet. What? He calls one of his servants and asks him, what's going on? Your brother's come home. Your father killed the fatty calf because he has him back safe and sound. His reply, he becomes angry. Is this a sign of emotional maturity or immaturity? He becomes angry. He refuses to go in. His issue is not the younger brother. His issue is not the father. You know what his issue is? The issue is him. He can't understand The father's love for the younger brother because he doesn't understand the father's love for himself. Listen to this. It's all about him. So his father goes out to plead with him. The boy doesn't come into the house. The father goes out to the porch to talk to him because he's so angry he can't come in the house. He answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. It's all about me. 
Don't you understand? I've worked so hard to get your love. And you give him a party and you never gave me anything. All these years, something has been building up inside of him. It says it right there. All these years. And when he finally blows, he's taking it out on the Father because he doesn't understand the Father's love for him. He doesn't know that he has the Father's love. So now the Father has to respond. And as fathers do sometimes, he's just going to lay him out. Listen, you little ungrateful. No, he doesn't. He looks, past, he looks past the behavior and he sees the need. What's the need? The need is he doesn't understand the father's love for him. Matter of fact, he says, I've been a servant. Oh, I'm a slave. The word doulos. I've been a slave. I've been working so hard. Don't you get it? I've been trying to earn your love. I've done all these things just so I could get your affirmation. Why can't you just show me that you love me? So the father responds. What does he call him? Listen to what he says. But when this son of your oh, yeah, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fatty calf for him. Verse 31. My son. Son. Child. Son. I love you. You are not a slave. You are my son. All these things I've done, it's not because I want something from you. I've given you responsibility. I've given you everything that I have is yours. My love for you is complete. You've missed it all these years. Because he says, all these years I've done all these things so that you would love me. What are you talking about? You didn't have to do any of that. I've always loved you. You got your order wrong. Here's a truth you can take to the bank. God does not love you because you are good. Sorry. God loves you because He is good. He loves you. I think that Christianity is the only religion that I'm aware of that says this. Every other major world religion talks about what you have to do to earn salvation or to become whatever it is you're supposed to become. It's all about your effort to be that. Christianity doesn't say that. It says, I already love you. It's all about the grace. It's all about the fact that my love for you is going to be sufficient. But remember verse 19 before? But because of that love, we can now love others. Because He loves us, because He has saved us, because He has given us that grace, we're saved for a purpose. Now we need to go out and love and show grace and do good works that God has created in advance for us to do. Not to earn our salvation, but to return the love that God's given us. You know, we don't even realize sometimes that we have that hole in us until we start to feel the rejection, the incompleteness. We start to do actions out of that need in our, in our heart. And uh, last week, Mike talked about grief. And I think next week, Rick's going to talk about things that we do to maintain that assurance of God's love in our life. But we need to come, keep coming back. That's why we're here today. We need to be filled with community to hear about God's love for us so that we can go out and love others because He needs to do a work in us. He needs to heal us, to fix us, to complete us. And only then can we love others maturely. You are a child of God. Look around. So is the person next to you. And because you are loved, we are free to love others. Romans eight, fourteen. 16, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the Spirit received brought about your adoption to sonship. By Him we cry, 
Abba, Father, Daddy. We are not slaves. We are children of the living God. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, get the order here? We don't have to be good so that He'll love us. He did it while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. How appropriate that today we have communion. So as the ushers come forward, we're going to enter into a time of communion. And as we do, I want you to meditate on this. I want you to think about God's amazing love for you. The sacrifice that He was willing to make for you. When? For all these years, you've been so good, you've been religious, you've done all... No. While you were yet sinners, He loves you. Not because you're good, but because...